Hi everybody, it's Christina. Welcome back to my front porch. So I left you hanging a couple of days ago with the timeless love story of Richard and Paulette. So I'm going to pick back up and read the next two installments for you today. The next one is called Mercy is Her Gift. Richard had been called to the ministry as a young man before his 13th birthday. His life became defined by that calling to God. To be a part of his life was to be equally yoked to that calling and to be married to it as if the calling were your own. Paulette chose her role as a faithful and dedicated wife of a Baptist preacher. So dedicated and so committed as she was, the stress of sharing her husband with his ministry day and night sometimes took its toll on her, and yet she never complained. She always loved me, he said, showing a moment of vulnerability, and I didn't know how to love her as I should, I must admit. I put the ministry ahead of her. Richard's father had been authoritarian and stern. He never lived the example of how to be a loving husband to his wife. Richard really didn't know how to love a woman. He didn't put her first. And so Paulette shared her husband with another mistress, his congregation. After graduating from seminary at Temple, Richard moved his family to Brandon, Florida, where he served as associate pastor for six years at First Baptist before moving his ministry once again to Griffith, Indiana, 40 minutes south of Chicago, Illinois, in 1979. Kelly, their daughter, was now 10, and as much as her mother had embraced her husband's calling, playing the piano every Sunday, now so would Kelly in her adolescence. At Griffith Baptist, Richard served as the head pastor, but he made a point of always staying connected with Kelly's peers at church. Her father's ministry would become hers as well. Paulette and Richard loved the young people at their church. They often enjoyed entertaining large groups of teens at their home. The energy of the youth they surrounded themselves with filled many holes in their marriage. Paulette's gift was mercy. So where Richard would play the stern and corrective father to keep their flock on track, Paulette would offer only motherly love and forgiveness, extending boundless kindness to all she encountered, regardless of the strain it put on her health and well-being. By age 40, after 10 years of service to the church and her family, the evidence of her failing health became all too apparent. First, she developed a lump on her thyroid, resulting in gorder surgery. Then, during a routine checkup, another lump was found on her breast. Within days, the biopsy that revealed cancer became a double mastectomy and a long bout of chemotherapy that cost Paulette her hair and many of her teeth. During this time, the gorder return on her thyroid, resulting in additional radiation to eradicate it. In the worst of health, Paulette never missed church. She always played the piano. Richard says, the suddenness of that situation brought me to realize how important she was to me. Forced into awareness of his wife's needs for the first time, he became humbled by all that he now realized she had given to support him in his calling. Now she became more than just a preacher's wife. Richard could see her as a mother, a caregiver, and a survivor, showing great courage and strength. Her compassion for others never faltered. I can't remember Paula ever letting anybody down, said Richard, and I know I had, but she never, ever failed to answer somebody else's call. She never disappointed. In time, however, Paulette could no longer handle the physically and emotionally demanding challenges of church and family combined. She was reluctant to give up her ministry to the youth and her commitment to Richard's calling, yet the task was just too great. So after 25 years, Richard stepped down as pastor in Indiana and moved his wife and daughter back to Memphis. This decision could not have come easily for him, still so young in his career, but his ministry was far from over. God's destiny for Paulette in June of 2005 would transform that ministry into something more powerful than Richard could have imagined. But more importantly, it would transform him into the loving and compassionate husband he had always longed to be. Transformed. 
Nothing of great significance occurred in history on Monday, June 6, 2005. Anne Bancroft died. The cleanup of the longest oil natural gas explosion in history in Crosby, Texas the prior week was ongoing. The Supreme Court voted down the legalization of marijuana that day in federal court. The American public commemorated the one-year anniversary of the death of Ronald Reagan the day before. It was nice weather, not too hot. Richard and Paulette had taken their bikes out for the first time that Saturday, the 4th of June. The newly, newly purchased home on Lovett Drive was the first home they had bought together as a couple. All their homes prior had been parishes provided courtesy of their church. Paulette looked forward to relaxed afternoons riding through the canopied and low-trafficked roads in the neighborhood. She had plans to landscape her yard with flowers and small shrubs. Over the holidays, Paulette had set up each room of the home to welcome and entertain guests. Her health improved since returning to Memphis, gave her a sense of vitality and a longing for independence. The dining room was set, ready for guests to be served. The living room held antique family artifacts around two love seats staged across from her piano, waiting to bring music into their home once more. Dozens of different styled and sized nutcracker statues adorned the den, the fireplace, and the mantel. Photo albums abundant lined the bookshelves waiting to be shared. Richard had taken on a role as associate pastor at Bellevue Baptist, a sizable church in Cordova, Tennessee, just outside of Memphis. His new position, with a congregation so large, was no less demanding than that of head pastor at the parish in Griffith. But now, the couple lived six minutes and nine-tenths of a mile from their daughter Kelly, who rented a townhome in an adjacent neighborhood. Paulette had family in Memphis still. Her in-laws were there, and more importantly, her mother Elizabeth Ferguson and her sister Janice. On that fateful day in July and June, Paulette decided she would take her bike to her daughter's home to do some light housekeeping for Kelly. Kelly, now 36, worked for another church and was expecting her cousin Leslie from Florida to visit the following weekend. As always, her mother graciously offered to help by cleaning for her. Though the drive was negligible, both Richard and Kelly had offered to let Paulette take their car. But the weather was so inviting. Paulette could not be swayed from taking a ride, feeling the cool breeze on her face and in her hair, the warmth of the sun on her pale freckled skin. The streets in Midtown are mostly narrow and old. Inclement winters have left roads rough potholes are patched and unstable. Choosing the sidewalk for her bike path, Paulette set off towards Kelly's town home on Hinton Place off Yorkshire Drive. One can never know what Paulette might have been thinking as she took a leisurely trek that late spring day. We might conclude that she was looking out about her, however, taking in the scenery, passerby, nonchalantly looking up at the sky. Perhaps she was daydreaming. Along the way, she passed in front of a privately owned convenience store near the intersection of Quince Road and Yorkshire Drive. A left turn there would take her to Kelly's house. Like the road, the sidewalk was old, cracked, and in one section completely marbled into crushed rock and gravel. As Paulette's front bike crossed this segment, her wheels slipped, tilting her forward, and gravity threw Paulette ungraciously cross and over the handlebars onto the cement below. First to hit was the right side of her head, just over her ear, then her shoulder, hip, and finally her lower leg. Immediately she became unconscious and everything in her world was forever transformed. She would never take that left turn. She would never make it to Kelly's again. The next 60 days of Paulette's existence would define her future and that of her loyal husband and daughter as never before. The woman whose life had revolved around her family, their church, and their friends and loved ones would now become unwittingly the apex of their attention. And God's will would forever be determined by love's new calling for Richard Kilpatrick.